Miigwech for that beautiful opening, Tori. On a bonjour, my Greenfield Dijnikas, Giwe no mkwe donjba, Kibok First Nation donjba, Giwe no mkwe endayong, and Norse donoki. So hello, bonjour, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Meyer Greenfield. I'm from North Bay, Ontario, and my family is from North Bay and Kibok First Nation, and I'm part of the Bear Clan. I have a mixed heritage with First Nation, Italian, Irish, and French settler relatives. And I do my best to live and be guided by the following the seven grandfather teachings and speaking to my friends and ancestors for guidance. Um, I live in North Bay, which is very close to Nipsing First Nation and is also uh, within the Robertson Huron Treaty area. And I'm speaking to you today from my home in North Bay. Um, my cat is really active right now, so um, hopefully she doesn't distract us too much, but she's running underneath my feet right now, so hopefully um, things work out with her, but just a heads up that if I'm distracted, that's why. <clears throat> I'd like to give thanks to my community um, and the lands that keep me safe and protected here um, in my home. I'm the Indigenous Program Manager here at Nourish, and I'm supported by a small but mighty team with my colleagues who are um, in the virtual audience today. Uh, Jen Reynolds, Robin Speedy, Rachel Chang, who is also helping with the tech part and much of what we're doing right now, and then also Shelby Montgomery. Um, Nourish is guided and supported by members of our Nourish Indigenous and Allies Advisory as well as our Nourish Advisory and a newly formed Board of Directors. And we also have a network of like-minded people and friends and colleagues who are always sharing, um, and many are here today on the webinar as well. So I'd like to officially welcome everyone here today. There's a lot of uh, people joining from, for different reasons and different areas. Um, some of us know Tori very well, including myself. Um, some are here as part of the learning journey for Food is Our Medicine. Um, some are here to investigate and check out Food is Our Medicine and what it's all about. So we have a really interesting mix of good people here today, and I think this speaks volumes um, about the good work that we're all trying to do um, and work towards um, food and reconciliation through food. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we are recording this presentation. So if you do need to go early, uh, it will be shared on our YouTube channel for Nourish. Um, but Tori will be reviewing the presentation before we post because sometimes things get shared that shouldn't be shared or recorded. Um, so we like to be mindful and respectful of what should and should not be shared through recording. Um, you might have seen some of the short films online yesterday um, and maybe today of Tori speaking about today's webinar um, from his home. So you'll find those videos of Tori as well um, and other uh, nourish videos on the YouTube channel too. And I'll post that link in a little bit. So I'm going to advance the screen. And looking at our agenda, um, I'm just going to direct you to the chat on the right side of your screen. And if you haven't already, um, you can share your name, um, maybe where you work or your occupation, where you're from. And the reason why I like to ask this is because um, when we put Food as Our Medicine together, we anticipated that it would be largely healthcare professionals who would be signing up for this learning journey. But what we've found is that there are many other professionals from food services to government and academia to students. And it's been a real eye opener and really exciting for me to watch and connect with um, learners from this journey. So I get the pleasure of connecting with you um, as you submit your teachings and also answer the questions from the learning journey. So I, I really enjoy this part of, of the job that I do with Nourish. Um, if you could also share in the chat what your favorite winter food is, it's nice to see what people are eating. And personally, I kind of like to copy what people are eating. Uh, these days for me, it's mostly soup and sandwiches. So I'd like to try something different soon. Uh, as we go along, uh, if you have questions or if you'd like to share your thoughts, um, you can also do that in the chat. And then at the end of this talk, hopefully we'll have time for a discussion, um, depending how long I talk for. Um, I also wanted to point out um, that we will be sharing a few um, short films near the end. So if you go into your Zoom settings, you can choose um, how you view your screen. Um, <clears throat> so in case you are new to Nourish and you are new to Food is Our Medicine, it is an action learning series. So very quickly, 
Nourish is a not-for-profit, and we believe that food is a powerful way to build health for both people and the planet. So in addition to providing comfort and healing to patients, we believe in creating more resilient communities while addressing climate change at the same time. So we work within cohorts and with an action learning series to achieve these goals. Food is Our Medicine is a series that was designed alongside the Nourish Indigenous and Allies Advisory to introduce healthcare professionals and leaders to new and different ways of understanding the complex relationships between Indigenous foodways, reconciliation, healing, and healthcare. So as you can see on the screen here, the series includes a learning journey, which is a 15 hour online, online course that is free of charge, and a webinar series, uh, which is happening today, and also a digital resource library. So all of this is hosted on our website and it is to provide deep learning into Indigenous foodways, but also through a healthcare lens. So you can find all of this information on our site and I'll share that in the chat too, once we get going. So today we're hosting our third webinar from our Food is Our, Web, our, Food is Our Medicine Action Learning Series. Uh, you can see in this beautiful artwork that Food is Our Medicine is based or presented to you through the four seasons. Each season has four teachings for you to complete at your own pace. So I'm excited to share that with a lot of long days uh, with my colleague, Rachel. Uh, we released our 2.0 version last Friday, and this is available on our website. So this is a lot more user-friendly and hopefully uh, more interaction um, with, with me as you go through. So we're really looking forward to seeing how this goes. Um, a little bit back, a little bit more about our webinars. We had hosted our first webinar last June in the summer. And we heard from a friend of mine and most of us, George Cucci, who is also from Nipissing First Nation. And George spoke to the importance of cultural mindfulness, and he shared his understandings of how the residential school system, along with the 60 Scoop and Indian hospitals, have caused um, massive intergenerational trauma for thousands of families across Turtle Island. And he shared how it will take many generations to heal from this trauma. Last September in the fall, we heard from Kitty Lickers and Kelly Gordon from Six Nations sharing about the importance of corn and the fall harvest and what this means to them and their families and their communities. <clears throat> so if you've missed these webinars, you can see them on our website as well. And again, I'll share that um, link in the chat after. So we have two more webinars that are scheduled to be offered after today. Um, looking forward um, into the spring on April 27th, we are gonna host a food is healing webinar, um, hoping to offer some knowledge around the salmon. Um, and then we will be hosting another webinar on June 21st in the summer, celebrating National Indigenous Peoples Day and food as a pathway. Um, last March in March, 2021, we released food is our medicine and we had set an internal goal to guide 400 learners to complete the learning journey by June 21st uh, of this year. So I'm happy to share that to date, we have more than 900 learners signed up for the learning journey and from over 350 different organizations across Canada. So not only healthcare, but post-secondary, food, government, and all sorts of folks that have personal interests in reconciliation have joined up for this learning journey. We've had 53 people complete their learning journey so far. So you can register for webinars and learning journey on our website. And when you finish, for the first 200 learners, um, you will receive a handmade pin by Brittany Gauthier. And for all of those who complete, uh, you will receive a certificate of completion um, with beautiful artwork that was designed by Maria, Mariah Muwagasi and Rally Rally and Freight Web. So I'm really excited to have Tori here today. A bit about how I know Tori. Um, he actually taught me how to introduce myself in Ashnabemawin. Uh, so it took me about six years to get the confidence to do this on my own, and I'd like to say chimigwich to Tori for this beautiful gift. I was looking through Tori's presentation, and it made me very happy to see the work that Tori has done uh, over the years, um, along with a lot of really important, cool people from Nibizing. Um, I had met Tori way back when I worked at Nipissing University about 10 years ago now, and it's hard to believe that it's been a decade already. Tori was attending the university and uh, he was steadily helping out with the programming that we ran through the Office of, Init of Indigenous Initiatives. And it was just always so nice to have Tori's presence for the events and just around in general. So building up to today, 
I've been able to speak with Tori on a few occasions um, before this webinar. And my daughter, Emmy was absolutely starstruck when I told her that we were going to Tori's place to film some footage last weekend for today's webinar. And uh, when I told her, I said, come on, Emmy, we're gonna go to Tori's place and we're gonna go be in the bush. And she said, you mean Mr. Fisher? I said, oh, you met, you met Tori? And she just was just staring because she was just so excited to, to be going to Mr. Fisher's house and she had never met him. She had only heard of him. Um, so though Tori might not agree with me, but because he's so humble, but uh, this is much, this is how much Tori has changed the landscape for Anishinaabe Mohan language um, just in the past seven years in our Catholic school system here in this area. When my daughter started school, there was no NSL class for her. Um, and now she loves and looks forward to going to NSL, even though it should call, be called NFL, um, but I'll digress. Um, so I'm just so proud and pleased to have Tori here. So focusing on this present time, my hope for the next hour or so is for us to listen with an open mind and open heart as we piece together how we can do something different to, to create and strengthen access to traditional foods and ways of knowing in our communities and healthcare institutions. So I'm gonna be sharing the slides from my end. Um, so Tori, um, feel free to cue me up or ask me to change slides or stop recording at any time. So in saying that, I'd like to welcome Tori Fisher, who's going to share more about himself and his thoughts on food as relationships and medicine. Miigwech. Um, <clears throat> are you able to uh, hear me good? Yeah, okay. So um, first, uh, before I begin, um, I want to, uh, I want to acknowledge the, uh, the animals, um, for their sacred agreement with, uh, with us as Anishinaabek people, um, and all the animals, um, that have been harvested in, um, in my lifetime have been harvested with, uh, Samoa being offered. So that's, um, tobacco and a giving of thanks for their life, um, so that um, we can have life uh, and feeding many of our many of our communities. So I'm putting um, <clears throat> I'm putting this disclaimer out there as I share personal pictures of my personal life experiences. Um, there will be animals that will be shown that are not living. Um, so I share this presentation with the utmost respect uh, for the animal life. Um, I share. Um, I share to teach and to help educate others. Uh, and it's my intention, um, my intention to uh, share my teachings uh, from a good heart and a good mind. Um, so I believe that there, there are many out there that uh, will begin to discuss a way forward, uh, ask questions and uh, be curious about understanding um, that uh, food is our medicine. Uh, so um, with that, when a bourgeo, waso avec des na cause ojik to deb, mon besinga king and I odd, sini kwagi widge mo, we did na ke ne ashing gete chik chowig wami, ne seven mena zigwan don suck dialog. Gary Noah, Mushroom, Suck, Menabot, Miss Suck, Gi Binjabog, and the singer King, and me go to end them, Nongam Gishgak Nongam Dush, the kid, me go to Gemina Do, Gami Jung Kanagago, me go to Wab Nong Nado, Jao Nong Nado, and Gabi of Nong Nado, Menog. so uh, my name is uh, Tori Fisher and uh, I am from the uh, 
I'm from the Fisher clan. Um, from the land uh, here called uh, Basing. Uh, my wife, uh, his name is uh, Tamara. Uh, she is from the Bird clan. Um, we got married in our traditional teaching lodge um, before all of creation uh, at our sacred grounds here at uh, Jocko Point. Um, Nea Shing is what we call it. Uh, we have uh, two beautiful daughters, uh, Nesewen and uh, Ziguan. Uh, so our grandparents and, and all of our past relatives, uh, the old ones, uh, they too uh, come from this place called uh, Basing. Uh, so I wanted to um, uh, share this quote with you. Um, it's Gawin we call connect Nikia Sim and the young mina Gawinadzi young. Gawin we call Kunin Missayong. Gawin we call Kunke Sim Heji Aoyeg. So that um, that means uh, never forget home uh, or our ways. Never forget us. Never forget who you are. Um, Gawin, so that comes from. Um, from the book Go and Gindas and Dausi. I am not a number. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, to help um, write that book in our language here with our uh, our fluent speakers here in our community, um, Dr. Mira Sawyer Bun and uh, Geraldine McLeod. Um, so this uh, this quote here, this is one of the last messages um, that Irene Cucci's. Um, mother uh, had told her um, as she was off to residential schools. So with that, it is, uh, it is with great hope that uh, my children will continue to follow the Anishinaabe road um, because I don't want them to forget who they are either. Uh, so I, um, <clears throat> so to, uh, uh, and further, I give, um, um, I give thanks to our, um, to the elders, uh, and fluent language uh, speakers and cultural teachers um, who have taught me about my own language and culture. Um, so I'm guided by our elders uh, from Basing uh, to learn how to properly speak the language uh, through listening and speaking. And uh, they tell us how best to uh, integrate our learning into our classrooms. Uh, so this is, um, this is a connection of, uh, of self, of who I am as a Nishnabe, uh, and is meaningful to my purpose um, of giving back. Our elders uh, uh, have, have gave um, so much to us. So I'm very, very, very grateful. Um, so going back to my language and learning, it has me continuously seeking more and more about my language uh, and my culture, as well as uh, uh, history, uh, ceremonies um, in the land. Uh, so I'm very, uh, very um, grateful for them. Um, so here there's a picture um, at a language conference in 2016, where uh, some of them, some of our fluent speakers that are in that picture are not here with us anymore. Uh, so, <clears throat> but also too, there are, there are other elders uh, who are not pictured here, um, who, uh, um, who I want to acknowledge as well too. So, uh, so um, my purpose today is um, is not to teach you about language and culture, um, although it is integrated into the presentation uh, because it is part of who I am as a Nishnabe, and there needs to be an explanation of understanding of connection to the land, uh, sacredness of the land, humility of the land, and land as our teacher. Um, there, there will be many questions uh, and wonderings about our language and culture because uh, some may never uh, have heard our language or seen our way of life before. Uh, perhaps maybe only heard stories and that's okay too. Um, <clears throat> however, my purpose uh, and motive um, are to tell you a story about my daughter's uh, uh, first wobbles uh, to allow you to uh, to think and to uh, rethink about the importance of uh, critical reflection 
time, um, space, and power. It is in our Anishinaabe worldview um, of how we come together and learn from one another through our stories. Uh, stories are told at uh, specific times for a particular learning experience. For example, I'm going to talk to you about the spirit of Wabos. And we are in a time of Bibun here. Bibun is our uh, storytelling time of year. Uh, so today we are, we are still following our original instruction of uh, storytelling in Bibun. So a uh, little bit of background is that um, uh, what we know. Um, so there are um, um, many health and educational disparities uh, Indigenous peoples experience that are linked to uh, social determinants of, of um, uh, such as uh, social, the political and economic means. Uh, so Indigenous people are often left to deal with the intergenerational legacy of residential schools colonization and assimilating policies, uh, which have directly contributed uh, to the health and educational disparities uh, experienced today. Um, additionally, Indigenous peoples have lower health outcomes and uh, lower graduation rates, which could be all linked back to historical trauma and social injustices. Uh, Indigenous people within the healthcare system have reported they have experienced racism, oppression, and discrimination. Alan and uh, uh, Smiley inform us that um, uh, many policies and practices relating to colonial beliefs had detrimental impacts uh, to social determinants, um, to health, such as access to education, housing, food security, employment, and health care. Simeon Brown described how uh, assimilating policies uh, impacted Indigenous communities, and they say that Colonialist policies, uh, which led to the loss of in traditional lands relegated uh, to reserve communities, uh, residential schooling, and the erosion of language and cultural traditions have contributed to a sense of loss of identity and community cohesion resulting in poor economic, social economic status, hopelessness, um, and despair with, uh, within many Aboriginal communities. So, um, share um, a recent uh, study so, um, <clears throat> that I um, conducted with my master's thesis, which I successfully um, uh, defended um, last May. Um, <clears throat> so, I adapted um, uh, the critical race theory uh, dominant cultural model from a Anishinaabe researcher's perspective. So, if you take a look at the diagram, in this case, uh, I am the researcher, um, the knower, and I establish the rules and or curriculum. Um, so as an example is designing, facilitating, and implementing cultural safety workshops, but from a Anishinaabe perspective. So in addition, um, uh, I had uh, 19 participants in the study. Uh, so they are to be understood as the researched on the outside and in this new model. Uh, so therefore, uh, the cultural safety uh, workshops are used as a way to bring knowledge to the research and create change to the broader educational system. So mine was focused on education. Um, so an example is uh, um, looking at uh, mandated curriculum. Uh, the study was an exploration of the role of leadership in supporting and advancing cultural safety within an educational organization. The study was conducted over four weeks um, at one hour per session for 19 educators and policy developers in Ontario. Uh, I discussed um, the cultural safety continuum, um, starting with cultural awareness, then cultural sensitivity, then competency, humility, and lastly, cultural safety. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to, um, to share this work um, with you briefly because um, although it was um, for uh, education, um, for, for the purpose of this presentation, I feel that the skills can be transferable to um, healthcare. Um, so I, I'll switch gears in a minute, um, I'll back to my personal story. So some of the themes that we learned um, 
was um, uh, what we learned from from the from the study was that um, is that um, um, critical reflections was one of the uh, um, major themes. Um, so self reflecting, such as uh, reviewing and reflecting on our own personal background. Um, but I understand that uh, through the research is that there was some challenges to that critical reflection. So it's, um, for example, one uh, participant said that it's hard to point out the differences when we don't know what the differences are. So it is hard to determine the differences. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the next was, uh, was time. Um, so participants, um, we had discovered that um, a dedication of time uh, was needed for professional learning about Indigenous cultural safety. Uh, time for self and understand that change takes time, uh, but requires uh, personal actions. Um, so for example, um, one participant had mentioned that um, I need to take the time to participate in these workshops uninterrupted. Um, had you, myself, the researcher, not pursued to do these workshops, it would have never been put in my path. Next is uh, space. Um, so it requires, uh, when we think of space, it requires uh, preliminary thinking about um, creating meaningful spaces prior to meeting with Indigenous organizations or, uh, or people. So uh, for example, um, Meyer had uh, offered tobacco for myself to be here, and I'm very happy to accept that tobacco. So there's some thinking that needs to happen uh, prior to. Also, engagement should be inclusive, um, such as uh, building on relationships, and it's not a one-time event. Um, should be ongoing. Um, one participant described how described the space is that uh, how we hold meetings and protocols about meetings, such as space or smudging, uh, it might not be the same um, uh, everywhere. It might be different uh, for different nations, indigenous nations. Lastly was uh, power, uh, was uh, there needs to be a disruption of power um, through intentional learning, uh, intentional hiring and personal actions. So example is uh, seeking out indigenous organizations uh, and or peoples as opposed to indigenous organizations or people going out to, uh, uh, out to educators. Next was uh, uh, power dynamics uh, by, um, by uh, critical questions. So for example, um, who had the power then and now? Who has the power then and now? And then also too is um, uh, who or what do we have access to? So I thought I would share that with you as um, um, to kind of uh, set some kind of thinking around um, the ideas of critical reflections, time, uh, space, and power. So uh, now um, I'm going to... Uh, uh, I'm going to be switching over to uh, my personal story. Um, so, um, I was talking about the um, uh, the medicine wheel. Uh, so, from a Nishnabe perspective, um, so healing takes place uh, from a holistic perspective. So, uh, we need to take our whole being into um, uh, into a perspective, uh, such as a mental physical, spiritual, and emotional. Um, this differs uh, in the Western perspective um, where it is either mental or physical, uh, which are treated differently. Um, it is about finding balance to our whole being, uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. We are told that if we, uh, we are out of balance in uh, any one of these aspects, um, then our whole being is, is not complete and it is being neglected. So uh, we think of balance uh, within ourselves. Um, if we are, uh, um, sometimes when we challenge ourselves mentally, uh, we forget about our emotions. 
when we forget to uh, feel things, uh, to be happy where we are, or, you know, someone gives us a compliment and, um, you know, we, you know, we try to turn it on, uh, where we, we have a hard time to accept those uh, emotions or good feelings. Um, also, if we think of ourselves uh, physically, um, we could uh, think of ourselves as uh, um, our exercise. So, uh, so the medicine wheel um, represents many different teachings to, uh, to life, uh, ultimately to uh, seek balance in our life. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, the use of it in a language often conveys a much deeper um, understanding to these teachings. Um, June Commanda, an elder, uh, fluent speaker in my community, uh, residential school survivor and longtime counselor, uh, she said to a class full of my students one time, you can follow um, a cultural way of life or not, uh, but if you truly know your language, then you'll know your culture whether you follow a cultural way or not. So what I understood um, was what she was saying was uh, meaning that uh, the meaning it describes is how to live a good life. Uh, so for example, if we look at the word uh, so for medicine uh, in the English, uh, but in Nishnabi thinking and ways of knowing is that word mshkikke, uh, means uh, strength from the earth. Uh, so we look at kinomage is, uh, is to learn or to teach. Um, so it changes the conceptual understanding uh, of the medicine wheel. Inherently, our elders uh, have told us growing up that our knowledge is in the language. Mother Earth is our first teacher. Our language is in the land. I can't... Um, I can't go anywhere else in the world to find my language. Uh, I just go down the road and I, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I uh, talk to the elders here. Um, so the medicine wheel um, tells us um, and teaches us many, uh, many things about life, um, such as uh, the four sacred medicines, the four original races, uh, four sacred seasons, four stages of life, four times of our day, four aspects of uh, human being, uh, four animal chiefs, four elements, uh, four sacred plants, and many more. Um, however, today there, there are, there's two things um, I wanted to uh, share with you today and it is focused uh, and it is focused on the medicine wheel. And the first is um, is the sacred parts of ourself, uh, mentally, physically, spiritual, and emotional. And the second is uh, the four sacred seasons. Um, there's there's a lot to learn in many of these things. So if we look at the four seasons. We uh, we look at Ziguen, so it's the spring. Nibin is uh, summer and Tkwage is our fall, and Bipon is our winter. So each season um, uh, has a, uh, a very beautiful gift and also um, a very powerful spirit uh, with it. I remember uh, one time um, Elder uh, Peter Bokesh, uh, Abhi Das Mose, uh, telling me that Gishpin uh, Bumose on Nishnav Emi Kad Ponegan Damta. Uh, which meant that uh, if you walk the Nishnabe road, uh, you will you'll always be busy. Um, I didn't quite understand what he meant 15 years ago, uh, but I just I understand it a little bit better now uh, when walking this red road. So we are um, we are always working um, we're always working towards finding balance. So first is uh, spirit, spirituality um, comes first in our life. Everything it is said to be connected, uh, all living things has spirit, trees, the plants, uh, the animals, the fish. Uh, we are all part of uh, 
part we are we are part spirit and physical that we are we have chosen this vessel um, in this physical realm and we are here for a short time uh, we are always looking for our for our, uh, our connection uh, for us it's um, it's uh, the land Takamekwa and Gujem uh, and the the uh, great spirit so when we walk in the bush uh, our spirit is among many other spirits um, they come and they can hear us and they speak to us in uh, in their own way next is our emotion um, is taking the time to feel taking the time to feel when we are happy or when we are sad uh, this is the one thing we have trouble with today uh, we are always in a rush. Um, so when we uh, next is our physical, is uh, is taking care of our body physically uh, by exercise. Um, our our exercise often comes in the in the form of uh, uh, in harvesting. So you know we're we're out walking in the bush or we're out on the lake uh, fishing. Um, lots of those things and then also too is um is uh mentally is uh challenging ourselves to learn uh we must always learn from our immediate environment so for example if we go in the bush one year it's not going to be the same the next it's always different so we're always challenging the land is always challenging ourselves to think about that so when we are when we are harvesting um we are incorporating all of those things uh, in our way of living. Uh, for example, uh, putting down our SAMO. Uh, so understanding our emotions when we are out there, uh, not getting too excited to uh, take more than what we need. Uh, also, we are told never to, uh, to be scared of the bush. Um, and we learn this through our fasting ceremonies. Um, Physical, we are um, taking the time to uh, to get up and out on the land uh, to feel our connection to the earth. And mental, we are always being challenged in our thinking and gaining a relationship with the animals about what it is that we are uh, doing there. Uh, it is, so it's all about balance uh, of ourself. Um, it is said that, um, as I mentioned earlier, it is said that if we uh, we are out of balance, um, then we're not fully uh, balanced with herself. Um, <clears throat> so next is um, um, the four um, four sacred seasons. Uh, so when we um, when we harvest animals, it is only it's a, it's important that we only take what we need. Um, so just like I mentioned about balance of ourselves uh, uh, holistically, uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, uh, we need to have balance. Uh, we need to uh, balance among uh, other nations, such as the birds, uh, the fish, the trees, the four-legged plant life, and the water. Uh, if we take too much, then uh, there will not be enough for the next seven, seven generations. And uh, we want to ensure that they have uh, what we have and more. Uh, so our family um, does our best uh, to live and eat uh, from the land as much as possible. It, is, uh, it has been a goal of my wife and I uh, since we first started walking side by side together. Um, so food is our, is our medicine by uh, following each season and the gifts that creation provides for us. Um, but, uh, also too, over the years is, uh, there's been, a, a lot of trial and error is, uh, learning, uh, learning and relearning and rethinking about how we, uh, how we do things. So I want to show you a little bit, uh, about that. Um, so Ziguan, um, Ziguan is my daughter's name, um, which, uh, my wife and I gave to her that name at birth, um, her, uh, her Nishnabe knows when, her spirit name is uh, Makons, is a little bear. 
Um, when Zigwin was born, um, my wife uh, um, started pushing at 1.21 a.m. And three pushes later at 1.24 a.m., uh, Zigwin was born. Uh, so that's where we got the name. Uh, so the, the word Zigwin in my language is, uh, is described, uh, it's been described to me by various fluent speakers that is talking about that flow of water. Uh, so when we think of Zigwan, the springtime, uh, just like my daughter's birth, is that when it's time to flow, uh, it is time. Uh, so the water will begin uh, will begin to flow uh, when it's ready, uh, whether we are ready or not. Uh, so life and creation is beginning to happen. Uh, it is a very special time for us as Nishnabe because it is in our Nishnabe. It's our Nishnabe New Year. So when the sap begins to run, uh, run in the trees. Uh, so soon here we will have uh, we will have that. So uh, uh, here is my um, uh, my wife and my my daughters, uh, and then also my uh, my niece. Uh, so we a lot of things are happening uh, out in the bush. So we go and collect uh, sap uh, to make. Uh, we either just drink the water or, uh, or we uh, make uh, syrup. Uh, but also too is um, um, we, uh, here we have uh, smelts. Uh, so all the families go out and they uh, collect some smelts uh, that run up the stream. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, the sap has a lot of good nutrients in it, uh, which helps regulate our bodies. Um, a long time ago in the winter, food became scarce um, and it would be hard on our bodies. Uh, so, but when we drank the sap, it helped our bodies balance out the blood in our bodies. Uh, next is um, uh, Nibin. Uh, so the word uh, Nibin is associated with plenty. Uh, so there's plenty of food to go around. Uh, so we have the, uh, uh, the fish, uh, the medicines. So Meyer, if you want to go one more ahead. Yeah, let me go ahead. Uh, so the fish, uh, the medicines, um, and uh, gardens are growing. Uh, so here in our community, uh, our uh, Nipsing First Nation Health Department, um, they had um, um, created our own, uh, our own community garden. So it's for everybody. Uh, so um, they uh, take care of the garden and uh, they let the community know when they, people can harvest certain uh, things. Uh, so also too is uh, here's my daughters and I, um, my wife, uh, um, creating our own garden in our backyard. Uh, so we've been having that going for quite a few years. It just seems to get bigger and bigger every year. Um, so my, uh, it's, it's always so nice when, uh, when uh, I love like watching my daughters, you know, when the strawberries are ready, they go and just grab it or the string beans, they just eat it. You know, they don't even clean it off. They just eat it, you know? <laughs> so uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, so uh, also um, here's, um, you can go to the next slide, Mary. Um, also next is, uh, here's our daughter, uh, um, setting a net in the lake, um, in here. Um, so what, uh, for us is, uh, we're gathering fish for our, for our elders or giving it away, um, to ensure that everybody has fish here in our community. Uh, so, um, next is, um, is my daughter is like, uh, uh, it's almost like uh, living on the lake here, Nipsing. Uh, we're known for our walleye. And it's like, uh, uh, this is like a, a rite of passage, I guess you could say, <laughs> not necessarily, but um, this is my daughter holding her first, uh, first walleye on her own. So she is, I don't know if she was scared or happy or both. <laughs> uh, next is, um, is Tkwag, uh, uh, so it's in the fall time. Uh, we begin to harvest um, many different types 
uh, of birds, uh, such as uh, our waterfowl, and, um, but they uh, ducks and geese, partridge, uh, also as well as uh, big game, such as um, such as moose and deer. Uh, very rarely we get bear, um, uh, but uh, uh, yeah. So that's you want to go to the next one there, Meyer. So here's the pictures of my daughters harvesting. So right from the time they're born, they're learning. They're learning uh, how to do this. Uh, go next again. So next is um, is uh, Bibon. Uh, so Bibon um, teaches that teaches us that uh, everything in creation uh, comes to a stop. Uh, so at this time of year, it's a it's a very um, a very hard time uh, for for our people or traditionally was not so much so now, but our stories tell us that. Um, this is the time if, uh, if we go back all the way to the springtime is that um, if we didn't, um, if we didn't uh, harvest enough or we didn't um, do enough of that, um, it's said that there's a, a spirit that comes, comes down searching for life. Um, so it's, it's a time for uh, uh, we had to uh, make sure that we had enough uh, uh, harvest throughout the year to make it through. That's why when we came back to uh, the springtime, <clears throat> we weren't um, we were eating what was left, and uh, that makes it very challenging on our bodies. So that sap really helps us. So next is uh, uh, I'm going to play a video. And Meyer, should I turn off my camera and my mic? Ogojo, waso abik dej na kaz, ojik to dem, man basing donj ba, tiga aning en dayad. Hello, my spirit name is waso abik. I'm from the Fisher Clan. I come from uh, Nipsing First Nation, and I am from Garden Village. I'd like to welcome the healthcare workers to Nipsing First Nation. Here is, uh, we are at my home. Not only is my home is in a physical place, but also to this territory. I consider all of uh, uh, Nipsing my home. Uh, so we're going to take a walk today and we're going to show you uh, a little bit how to snare rabbits today. So when I think about uh, all these animals that we harvest from the bush, is one of the things is that uh, for people in the healthcare is that when they're when they're given these um, these animals to eat first is that their nutrition is uh, very very good. Everything that the animals eat in the bush is medicine. For example, if we look at our deer at this time of year, food is becoming scarce and all that. They they'll be eating a lot of cedar right now as to boost their immune systems up that medicine cedar is really, really good for them. So if we were to eat that, we'd be getting that same medicine inside of ourselves too. Just like the rabbits, they eat a lot of, uh, they eat a lot of these the birch tips. So a lot of the medicine that birch carries, it's like a blood medicine or anything like that. It'll, so when we consume that stuff too, is that we're getting the medicine that the, that the animals are eating. For example, if our people are getting this type of food, it might build their own uh, their own self-esteem too, uh, you know, because they may have stories in their own communities where, you know, one time they went uh, harvesting or they had went with a family member. Uh, so it's going to bring a lot of uh, uh, good medicine back to themselves about their own stories and reflecting on their own life, looking back on a time when they they harvested this or a family member. So it's a real connection back to their place, wherever their home is. For me, it's it's Nipsing. So I think um, I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think what is important is um, is the conceptual understanding 
of our ideas of medicine. Uh, so the term medicine in a Western perspective uh, could be understood as uh, 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 Tylenol or over-the-counter medication, uh, which is important. Uh, but the research um, of uh, Klein um, and others uh, purport that um, communication between healthcare professionals and Aboriginal patients is often clouded by cultural differences, uh, which stems from colonization. So in their study, um, health professional students uh, participated in a community-driven service uh, learning program, uh, which they were to learn with and from and about community uh, through a cultural program uh, for youth. Uh, so the, the cultural difference that was most frequently identified by 67% of the students was a better, a better understanding of a broader concepts, uh, such as family and community. Family was viewed very differently from the health professional students perspective compared to the cultural camp youth. 58% of the students learned uh, about how important community connection was on well being. Uh, so, one professional, um, uh, health professional student, discussed that good medicine is a connection to family and community, um, which originally they would have understood the term good medicine uh, as something very, very different. Um, so, for example, from a First Nation perspective, Good medicine uh, could be described as uh, uh, songs, dance, uh, traditions, culture, teachings from the elders, and harvesting. Uh, so next is our um, <clears throat> uh, next one is we have another video for you. Oh bonjour, waso abik des nakaz, ojik to dem. Man basing donj ba, tiganing and dayan. Hello, my spirit name is Waswabik. I'm from the Fisher clan. I come from uh, Nipsing First Nation and I am from Garden Village. I'd like to welcome the healthcare workers to Nipsing First Nation. Here is, uh, we're at my home. Not only is my home is in a physical place, Myers, is this the same territory. Video? I consider all of Sorry about that. I think I have the next one now. I didn't advance the slide. There we go. One of the uh, biggest job I have is uh, becoming a father. One of my roles as a father is becoming a protector, harvester, following the seven grandfather teachings, and making sure that I pass these on. My wife and I, Sydney Kwe, uh, her name is Tamara in English. When we had first started walking this way together, uh, side by side, in marriage or in companionship, we really wanted to ensure that our kids became strong in uh, understanding who they are and their place in the world. When we, uh, anything that we do, we, we make sure to include our kids. So if we go fishing or rabbit or snaring, is that we want to make sure that when they get older is that they have the, the values of uh, giving back to their community. So when we harvest uh, these animals, I want to ensure that she's following the steps in a good way. I want to make sure that she's using her sama, understanding that they're not the only person in this world. There's, we're living amongst all of creation. So it's to have a respect for all things. The trees, when we're walking in the bush, is that each of these trees, they each have their own spirit. We don't want to just go in and break all these branches and make a big mess. And we want to make sure that when she's going in, she's going to the place that she needs to go. And that uh, when she walks out, she walks out in a good way. We talk about that as, we uh, never uh, be so it's walking in a good way. So when we talk about walking in a good way, it's really, it's a really deep understanding of the land here. We want her to know these stories. For example, this trail is a couple hundred years old. Uh, her grandfather was actually on these trails. 
So we actually want her to know that seven generations from now, that there's also going to be kids just like her wanting to eat from the bush. So she only needs to take what she needs. She doesn't need to take what, what she wants. So there's a big difference between a need and a want. We had went out uh, a little ways from here and uh, she got her first wobbles. We've been reflecting back on that, how awesome that is. We actually got two that day. But one of the things that we were kind of laughing about was, I don't think I ever remember being so excited for a rabbit in my whole entire life. I think about how excited I was as a father. My daughters are six and three. They got a rabbit much earlier than I did in life. But already at that age, um, she's, they, they both, uh, you know, use their Samoa. Uh, they both uh, set their own snares and they gave away back to the elders. So when I think about that as a father, is I already know that she knows everything that she needs to know on how to harvest for herself and for others in life. That to me is very rewarding. <clears throat> we're in a time we're actually unable to uh, harvest rabbits, so we're just gonna demonstrate today. So our land tells us at this time that all the, the Wabos Nation are uh, currently, um, uh, they're reproducing. So it's at this time we actually wouldn't harvest these animals, we would stop. We usually we would harvest them when the snow first goes on the ground, right into about uh, late January. Also right now we're in Makwagizis, the bear moon. And the bear moon is right now they're having uh, babies. We want to be very careful about how we're walking in the bush right now because it's a very spiritual time that's going on right now in the bush. There's a few things that need to happen before we go out. The first thing is we always need our Samoa. So our Samoa is what guides us. Before we walk in the bush, we give thanks for life. Miigwech Kanagiago is what we say. We would leave the snare overnight and then we'd go back and we'd check it early in the morning. We have to go early in the morning because we're not the only ones that want to eat. We develop a very special relationship with the bush and all the other beings that are there as well too. Before we take this, we ask this, uh, we ask this uh, tree to give up its life to help us find life. So we put our tobacco down for this. Then we clean it off, like that. And then uh, we, uh, we go to Canadian Tire, okay? Uh, all the uh, Nishnawi people, it's a very sacred place for us. <laughs> is we, uh, we use our, uh, we go and buy some snare wire. And then we would, uh, we have also from Canadian Tire. I feel like an advertisement now. But uh, we would uh, use little pliers and we'd, uh, we'd rig up our, uh, our snare wire. So we would make it a nice uh, long, uh, long snare wire. And then what we would do is we would tie it up to, uh, to this tree. So we would actually have, uh, we might have anywhere from maybe uh, five to 30 of these. Uh, depends how serious you are trying to get uh, your food. And then we would tie that, uh, tie that uh, snare wire to, uh, to the tree. So <clears throat> once we would go in, we would actually have maybe a big bundle of these that we would actually um, try and just leave in the bush or at least leave along the way. Because when we, uh, when we snare, uh, one of the things that we always have to remember is the respect for the animal. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we, when we go out, that animal is not suffering. We make the snare wire about the size of our hand. That's about uh, the rabbit's head and uh, neck. So they go in there. We make this stick nice and long so that if they get uh, stuck in this, when they go running in the bush, the stick is actually gonna get caught up in the bush so that they don't go very far. They're not going to, uh, they're not going to suffer. As soon as, they, as soon as they pull on this, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not gonna be long. So what I would do is I'd walk a little bit on the side. You want this stick nice and long, so you can just kind of go in like this. Two sticks like this. 
I want him to jump up through that and underneath. So stick his head out. Once we harvest the rabbit, we put down our Samo, Samo Gopkidna. I put down my Samo and I say, Miigwech Wabos Maatsawin. Thank you Wabos for your life uh, so that I could have life. In our community, uh, what we've been taught is that once we get the rabbit, is we'd find an elder in our community and we'd go give it to them. We may only keep one rabbit. If we get 10 rabbits in a year, we might only keep one or two for ourselves and all the other ones would go out for the elders. Not just rabbits, we're always uh, giving back to our elders because they need, that, they need that food because that food is medicine. So when we give that food to them, they're able to have uh, lots of good nutrition. So as, uh, as we explained is that um, uh, going out into uh, the bush, uh, we usually go out before dark and um, we uh, try to go early in the morning, uh, uh, the next morning. Uh, so every time we go out, uh, every time we went out for rabbits, uh, it's not like you get them all the time. Uh, so you have to continually go back out. Uh, so when we, uh, when we, when we kept going out uh, uh, with my daughters, uh, we would come close, um, uh, come close to catching them or they would run by. The rabbits are really smart. Okay? Uh, so sometimes I'd build a wall around the snare and then they would, um, uh, they would run around the snare <laughs> or just run around the wall. Um, so I'd have to find other ways. Um, sometimes they could smell you too. Uh, so when we, uh, um, so with my daughters this year was, um, uh, they didn't really understand what was happening. They were just seeing um, tracks, you know, all they knew um, uh, was, you know, just what I said, oh, the, the rabbits knocked over the snare or they ran around the snare or they ran around someplace else. They didn't run here today. Uh, but when we, um, when we got our first rabbit, um, uh, I saw it right away and, um, <clears throat> I wanted, um, um, my daughter to come and see it and I let her go in by herself and, and, uh, check. And she said, first thing she said, there's nothing there. And, uh, I, I keep looking cause it's white day. Eh? And so I remember, um, uh, uh, my daughter, She's just like, oh, she started she start smiling and uh, she started shaking. She was so excited. Um, and she was very curious about the rabbit. Uh, she was scared to touch it at first. Um, uh, she was so, uh, she was just so full of life. Uh, I know as, uh, um, as parents, we were, uh, we were really excited and uh, we couldn't stop smiling. And um, it, was, uh, it was like a life stage moment um, that we were, uh, that we'll never forget. Um, but as I mentioned in the video, I, I still think about that is I don't ever remember being so happy for a rabbit, you know, I used to get rabbits. And when I was younger, it was cool, you know, and, uh, being a father, it's like, uh, you know, all that coolness is, you know, I want to take pictures and I want to be in that moment, you know, and, uh, I want my parents to be like, Oh, you're not making me cool right now, you know. I want to be that parent, so that's fine with me. Uh, so, uh, following our um, our uh, uh, when we when we would uh, catch them, is that uh, uh, we taught uh, our daughter how to um, what we do is we clean them and then we give them to the elders. Uh, so, following the amazing tradition, when we do something for the first time, uh, so we get a big game kill or we make something for the first time, uh, we usually give it away to someone. Uh, so I asked my daughter, who do you want to give it away to? And uh, her first response was uh, Gopmas and Mishomas. And uh, so I'm very, uh, I'm very proud that, uh, um, because I, re I, was, I was told when I was younger is that um, when, we, uh, when we're able to do these things, is that uh, we should be giving them um, to people who are maybe um, uh, sick or, or 
elderly, um, make sure that they get them. Um, because then if we are sick or if when we get old, um, then they, the next generation will do the same thing for us. Uh, so we, um, that's how we follow. That's how we keep our culture strong. So, uh, um, so yeah, so I, uh, I, uh, Miigwech for uh, for listening uh, today, and um, I don't I don't get the um, uh, I'm very honored to be here, but I don't get the honor of seeing you. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I hope that wherever it is that you are, um, uh, I wish you all the best, and uh, uh, Miigwech for uh, taking the time to uh, to listen to me. It is a is a true honor. So I say Miigwech. Miigwech, Tori. That was amazing. It's a really nice share. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I do see a couple of questions here um, and then also a thank you. So I think we'll start off with the first question if that's okay. It says, hi Tori, I'm curious to know what inspired you to want to become a teacher. It is a common practice. Is it a common practice in your family or did something compel you to follow this path? Um, there's a, <laughs> I wasn't quite ready for a question like that, but, uh, I, um, this is a hard one for me actually, because, uh, I say it respectfully because I really respect my position now where I am and I'm very honored to be in the position that I am, but I didn't want to become a teacher. <laughs> I just, um, I just, uh, uh, so I, I say that respectfully, but um, but uh, I, I love being a teacher now. Um, but it's really what uh, I'm. I am made of my community, and my community has um, um, guided me. I listen to our elders. I listen. I, I originally just um, um, started learning the language, and uh, um, and then after that was. I went to school and just, I just kept going with the flow <laughs> kind of thing, so. Thanks, Tori. Thank you for your question. Uh, here's a comment from the, from the chat from Marley Fisher. Um, Anashak, I believe that's Lanape, but I'm not for sure. Yep. Yeah, okay. Yep, it okay. is, yeah. For explaining the cultural lens on food as medicine, I know our idea of what that means is different than the Western idea of what that means. And I find mainstream dietitians are very against that concept because they don't want people to replace their medication with food, understandably. But for Indigenous people, medicine is not just medicine, medication, it is all things good for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly when we think about um, um, like, uh, let's say, for example, if we're getting, uh, we're getting this food. Um, a lot of, uh, let's say, for example, I, I know when uh, where I am, uh, North Bay, we have a lot of people from from the far north. Um, I know Sudbury gets people from the far north. Um, <clears throat> but you know, when uh, when they're getting these um, when they're getting this type of food, uh, it brings a, a strong connection back to uh, to their place too. Uh, might have a story about you know, how they catch, uh, how they catch fish or how they have something. So it's actually, uh, it goes, uh, much, much further than just the diet itself. Uh, but also too, is our, um, our well being. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm not sure if you're seeing the chat, but Monique Sawyer says, um, the outdoor ed class is watching. So I just wanted to oh. know that you saw that. <laughs> Bonjour. <laughs> um, this one is a little bit hard. So if you don't feel comfortable answering right now, that's fine. I can follow up as well because I'm not sure how I would answer this either, but I'm just gonna throw it out there. How do you think we could support our clients um, who are in urban centers who do not have access to traditional foods, um, gathering and hunting and activities? I feel like living in a city is such a huge challenge or barrier and there's so much benefit, not just from the nourishment from food, but the activity as you describe. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I think that really um, when I talked earlier about um, like critical reflection, like it it really does take a lot of critical reflection to kind of think about what it is that needs to happen. Um, <clears throat> so one of the biggest things that I 
as I, I think about is kind of having, you know, building those relationships with communities that are possibly close around. Um, I know for us here in our community, we have, you know, North Bay in our community is right here. And many of those people, uh, many of our people uh, harvest. So I think it's about building those good relationships and reaching out, um, uh, reaching out to them. Yeah, I agree. I also think we're a bit spoiled here because we have such a, a strong community that we can reach mm -hmm. out to. I know we've talked about that before too. Mm -hmm. We're going to move on to another question. Miigwech for sharing. When introducing gathering hunting to, to patients for the first time, what teaching or activity would you recommend starting with? Um, obviously, it would be different season by season, they say, but um, mm -hmm. what would you recommend first? Yeah, I, uh, any season, just go and uh, and one of the one of the things that uh, I, I uh, learned from other um, hunters here in our community is uh, is uh, we're always sharing, we're always sharing stories, um, and uh, that's why our elders always said like, listen, you know, our stories are really important. Um, uh, my uh, my my uh, uh, in the fall time. Uh, my brother and I went out moose hunting and uh, we um, <clears throat> I went out and that was his first moose and uh, and uh, it was a really exciting time and uh, anyways I had to um, I had to split the moose in half uh, all I had was a knife and um, I never did this before but his his uh his, uh, he was telling me, he said, where did you learn that? He said, he said, looks like you've done that so many times. I said, uh, I said, I just listen to what people are, what they, when they tell their stories, you know, go three ribs down and then go down all the way to the back, do the other side, cut the hair. And I said, uh, I said, I've only ever been told. And I told him, that's why our stories are important. You know, we have to listen, like, you know, what uh, people are saying. So I think um, is uh, almost kind of going back to those relationships, but, you know, as within each season, there's certain people who are doing certain things is go talk to them and ask them, and uh, listen to what they have to say. You know, uh, sometimes when we go uh, duck hunting, you know, sometimes the ducks don't land in the spot that we want them to land, you know, but uh, somebody went there and when you go next is, Oh yeah, they're over there, you know, and oh, okay. So we, you know, go set up over there. Um, so we're always uh, we're always sharing with one another. I know our community here is um, uh, everybody respects really strong families here, and uh, we we each carry a, a very uh, specific knowledge. I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. I think so. Here's another one. We are here, and thank you. It makes so much sense as to why I remember my time as a young child with my family out in nature, most fondly of all my childhood memories. So thank you for sharing. I needed to hear your words, especially today, and remember that keeping those family stories alive are good medicine. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And then here's a question. Uh, what is your vision for how food could be integrated as medicine into everyday healthcare practices? Hmm. And what do you think that impact could have? Oh, um, I, I was actually kind of thinking about this, you know, like, um, you know, considering, um, considering the amount of um, um, resources. And when I, I don't, I'm not calling the animals a resource, but when we look at food is that, um, you know, when we, when we think about, you know, um, how much can we really provide, you know? Uh, but I think about, um, you know, as for possibly for some of our patients, you know, it'd be nice for, um, you know, hospitals to reach out to communities and hire uh, Indigenous people, you know, if they get an opportunity to, you know, for us, uh, you know, is uh, hire our community members to go harvest in a certain time of year to bring certain things and, you um, I know before, you know, even thinking about uh, feast, you know, wild feasts is um, uh, having uh, nights where 
we can feast together, you know, obviously before um, uh, pandemic, um, you know, and into the future is that hopefully that we can gather again and creating those. Um, that's another way to build those relationships too, is, you know, having those feast nights and, you know, food really brings us together and, you know, inviting people to come in and uh, bring that, uh, you know, wild food and everybody could share, share together. Yeah. So one would be is hiring community to, um, or yeah, hiring community to harvest in a certain time of year. Um, and I know some places are doing that too. And uh, um, two is uh, uh, bringing people together and, uh, into a feast. Mm -hmm. Potluck style. <laughs> Here's another comment. I'm not going to pronounce this properly. I know, it, but I'm going to try. Uh, Sue Cape Tori, when I did my um, Iniskim transfer, which is bison ceremony, uh, and we were preparing the meat for the community, our elder encouraged us all to listen to the Imi, um, to let the, con the contours guide us, um, to do that with respect, to connect to the spirit that stepped forward for us. Mm. Thank you guys for sharing that. So if there's any more questions, please feel free to, to send them along in the chat, but I think we've answered all the questions so far. And so with that, I think we'll, we'll end the webinar five minutes early. And I wanna say Chimigwich, Tori for sharing again and for everybody for joining us here today. Mm. Miigwech, everyone. Oh, I think someone's raised their hand. Oh no, <laughs> I can't see. <laughs> mm. I can't see what's happening. Um, okay, so miigwech everybody. And um, all of this will be posted online too. So we'll see you next time. Miigwech. Bye, my pee. <laughs>